Thank you, worship team. I really appreciate all that you do. I prayed with them this morning, and I said, you know, back in biblical days, when, is, when the Israelites went out to fight, they had the worshipers that went out before them. And uh, I just really appreciate um, all that they do. My name is Jeff Willits, and I'm one of the elders here at uh, Susquehanna Valley Church. Pastor Matt is enjoying his anniversary, so he's away, and uh, hopefully the elders won't play. So we'll be, uh, hopefully we'll be, we'll be at it. Did you ever notice something about people? They're different. <laughs> They're different. I have become my grandfather. And that is, when my grandfather used to take my grandmother to the store, he never went in with her. He would sit in his car for hours. And I used to think, what in the world is he doing in that car? I've become, I know what he's doing. He's a people watcher. Now, how many of you admit that you love just to sit and watch people. You go to, when we used to, we're allowed to go in the malls, my wife walks in the store, she says, honey, there's a bench right there. So I'd sit and I'd watch at the bench. People are different. The way they walk is different. The way their hairstyles, their clothes, the way that they treat each other, they're all different. But I come to a realization that there's one thing that all of us have in common. And this one thing perhaps has happened to us in the past. Maybe it's happening to us right now. Or it's going to happen to us in the future. And that is that there's something in our life that's going to come into our life that's going to shake us. That's going to overwhelm us. Perhaps even paralyze us in some way or another. And that's a giant. And maybe in your life it's a momentous giant. And you're going to say, how in the world am I going to defeat this giant that has come into my life. I want to start off by asking you a question. What would you be willing to do if God was with you? I heard that statement a couple weeks ago and I thought, man, that is a powerful, powerful statement. What would you be willing to do if you knew that God was with you. Now, I grew up in a family of uh, six boys, no girls. And I was number three. And my older brother, he was sort of my hero. Number two brother, he used to beat me up all the time. I mean, he'd, he'd beat me to the pulp and beat up the pulp. In fact, the one time he got so angry at me. Now, how many of you remember that show, Dragnet? Remember that show, Dragnet, Joe Friday? I followed him around one day with a little notebook. And I said, at 12.02, Michael did this. At 12.30, Michael did this. And man, I had a book on him. And he found out about it. Well, he beat me up. But there was something wonderful about my older brother. When I was with him, I had the best time. Michael did not beat me up when I was with my older brother. You know why? Because my older brother would just take care of business. And I could virtually do anything with my older brother. But man, when my older brother was with me, I had confidence because I was on his team. Now, there's a wonderful story in the Bible, and we, and we certainly, we know it all about this story. In fact, people who are not even Christians, believers, know the story 
about David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. They know it well. But there is such detail in this story that if we simply read through this story and glaze through the story, we're going to miss some detail in the story. I want to just share with you very, very quickly four things that we can see. As David faced this giant, and by the way, these are things that David unleashed the power of God in his life. And if you're taking notes, the very, the, I want you, if you can, to take some notes if you can today, write them down. But I want to set the scene a little bit, and then we'll look into some scripture. The nation of Israel is on one side of a valley, which is called the Valley of Elon. It's the Valley of Blood. And on the other side are the Philistines, the Philistines. And they're getting ready to go to war, and all of a sudden, something happens that they didn't account for. The meanest, ugliest, over nine foot tall giant walks out in the field. And Israel does something that they normally don't do. The Bible says they were feared, they were filled with fear. And then they ran with fear. Now, as a kid, I have been fearful. My grandmother's basement put fear into me. When I was down there alone and the lights were on, oh man, it was great. But when she called me upstairs, I turned the lights off and I knew something was coming after me. And I used to run up them stairs every time because I would look back. Something is going to get me. I was ran in fear. All of Israel ran, fearful, mighty men of God, warriors, trained warriors ran and were scared. A little bit of ways ago, a few miles, Jesse had a son named David. David was out doing what David was told to do. He was keeping the sheep. You know, shepherd's job was not an envious job. In fact, the servants didn't even want to do the job of a shepherd. But his dad called him over and said, Look, I want you to take some provisions over to your three brothers that are at the battle, and I want you to take some, some presents to their captains. And David did. David went over to the battle, and he found something amazing. The first thing that David did when he went to the battle was David got offended for God. David got offended for God. God gave him a God task. God gave him a burden, a burden. He got offended for God. 1 Samuel 17, verse number 26. It says, Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God. Let's look at verse number 29. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? David got offended for God. When was the last time you got offended for God? Boy, we live in a society today that we can get offended for ourselves. I mean, i got to tell you, in the scheme of eternity, what the Washington football team will be named, I I really don't think that's going to really matter in eternity, do you? 
And, and, and we will, there will be people that put out so much energy and got so offended. Now, I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong. But when was the last time we got offended for God? What about our own lives and our own relationship to God? Do we get offended when we hurt God? Uh, when I read in Proverbs, I see it says there are things that the Lord gets offended. He uses the word hate in some of the Bibles. There are six things that the Lord hates, even seven. The seventh one is those that cause dissension among the brethren. That offends God. Pride, that offends God. Selfishness, that offends God. God. I think one of the greatest offenses to God is that when we turn our back on his son. When we turn our back on his son. I think that's one of the greatest offenses. I think another offense to God is when we put down the little ones that are around us. God loves the little ones. He says, suffer unto, to bring them unto me. Now my youngest son, he had a teacher, Christian school. One day he came home and he said, I'm stupid, I'm dumb. Well, where did you get that at? Well, my teacher told me that. In fact, he told all the boys that, she did. You're dumb, you're stupid. Do you know that offends the Lord? You are precious in God's sight. That offends the Lord. They were all there, and they were all terrified. And David shows up, and he's the only man who said, that giant cannot talk to our God the way he does. David carried an offense for God. David carried a burden for God. David, the man after God's own heart, all he did was see and hear the giant and watch all the experienced warriors of a nation run and cower. You say, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what offends God. You know, David spent so much time with the Lord. He's had such a close relationship with the Lord that he knew what offended the Lord. The more we read the Bible, the more we pray, the more we spend. In fact, if we're married, we understand when we can offend our mates. David knew what offended the Lord. The first one was David got offended for God. Let's look at the second one. And wow, this is one we should put some stars around. David was not stopped by discouragement or criticism. He was not stopped by discouragement or criticism. The minute David said, I'm going to do something for the Lord, his oldest brother, Elab, said to him, I know the naughtiness of your heart. You ought to be back there watching daddy's few sheep. You ought to go back to the sheep. That's where you need to be, David. His own family discouraged him. His own family. You see, when you get ready to do a God task... When you get ready to take on a burden of God, don't look for a lot of this. It may not come. It may not come. But David had a brother. David had a family that discouraged him. King Saul called him in. 1 Samuel 17, 33. Notice this. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against the the Philistine, to fight with him. But thou art but a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. David, you just can't cut it. 
You're just a, you're just a young boy. This is a man of war. His own family discouraged him. The king discouraged him. And may I remind you of something? When he was a young boy and he was watching the sheep, Samuel the prophet came to Jesse's house and said, hey, I need to see all your sons. you remember that? And he lined up all his sons, and, and Samuel went all through the sons, and he's like, no, this is not this. Is. He said, don't you have anybody else? And his own dad said, oh, yeah, yeah, the youngest, he's in the field watching the sheep. And Samuel said, bring him over here. And He was the one. He was the one. His own dad didn't even think of enough of him to bring him before Samuel. You know what I've discovered in life, in reading the Bible? God loves to use the one. God loves to use the one that everyone else has passed over. He loves to use that one. The Gideons of the Bible. The Davids of the Bible. He loves to use those ones. When we were in school, many of you will remember this, how many of you played kickball in school when you used to do all that stuff? And you used to get the two best guys on the team. Remember that? Oh, we're going to pick a team. You're the captain? You're the captain. Pick your team. You go first. And they go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And all of a sudden, you remember the last guy? He was probably the worst player. And, and you sort of, he didn't get picked. He sort of like was, okay, well, he's the next one to go over here. You kind of felt bad for that guy. That was David. David was the last guy to get on the kickball team. He was the one that was rejected to the end. But you see, David carried an offense for God. David was not stopped by discouragement or criticism. And I want you to notice the next one. David lived a life of impossible. David lived the life of impossible. Before he ever got in front of Goliath, he had already lived a life of impossible. This wasn't something strange for David. Let's look at what the word of God says in 1 Samuel 17, 34 through 36. And he said unto David, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. Now, now, let me just say this to you. If I was advising David, I wouldn't have said that. I would have said, I was in the agribusiness and a head of security for my father's business. But he didn't. He said he was just a shepherd. Just a shepherd. Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock, verse 35, and, and, and I went after him, and smote him, and delivered him out of his mouth, and when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David, you mean to tell me that you killed a lion and a bear and no one was even watching? And you never trumpeted it out to people. This is what I did. Wow. Now, I have to tell you, I thought about this. What would I have done? Here I am as a shepherd watching this happen. I think I'd have been like this. Bye-bye, lamb. I mean, see you later. Uh, they got to eat too, right? They got to eat too. Bye-bye, lamb. No one person was there to see but the God, but God. And David did the impossible. He went after the lion, and he went after the bear 
when no one was watching. And he did it all for the Lord. Now, as a guy, once in a great while, my wife will laugh at this, I wash the dishes. And you know what I say to her when she comes home? Hey, did you notice, honey? Notice I did the dishes? Oh, thank you so much. You know, have you noticed I've done them for 40 years? Now, when I'm retired, I clean the house on Mondays. And I love vacuum cleaners. You know why? Vacuum cleaners will leave wonderful marks. And she'll be able to see that I clean the house. You see, I don't know what it is. But all of us like that. I mean, if, if, if I had killed a bear and if I had killed a lion, I got to tell you, it had been on TV. Somebody would have put it on YouTube or something. That's how we are. We do like the applause. We do like the trumpet when something wonderful happens and we're a part of it. But what do we do when no one is watching? What do we do? Do we do it for the Lord? David lived a life of impossible. It's what he did. It's who he was. I want you to notice the last one. David had God on his stones. David had God on his stones. David understood that he couldn't, but God could. We know what happened, don't we? David went down to the brook, to the brook and he picked up five smooth stones. Now listen, David didn't kill that giant. God killed that giant. All David did was just wing the stone. You know, if you look in Judges, the book of Judges, you find the armies and how they're put together. They had a group that had the spears, and, and they had a group that had the bow and arrows, and they had a group, they called them slingers, and they were left-handed. Now, wasn't that something? And here's the thing. I can imagine the group of slingers that was watching this. And all of a sudden, David goes up and he picks up these five stones. Five smooth stones, by the way. This is a stone that I've, I've, I've had for a lot of years that I got out of Smoky Mountains. And man, it's just so smooth. It's very aerodynamic. And it's pointed. I was reading. They say that David... When, he, when they released those stones, when David released that stone, they say those stones come out of that pouch, out of that sling, over 100 miles an hour. Now, I've played baseball. One of the toughest pitchers I ever went against was a guy from Lower Dolphin. I was scared. He was a left-hander, and I do not like to hit against left-handers. You don't know how the ball is getting released. And he threw 90-some miles an hour in high school. But I got on first base. Interference from the catcher's glove because I swung too late. But man, 100 miles an hour. 100 miles an hour. But we know what happened. Let's read in 1 Samuel 17. Let's begin in verse number 37. It said, David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with thee. Verse number 40. And he took a staff and his... He took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. And he put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in the script, and in his sling was his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. Now, let me just stop there, right? Now. Well, let me, let me keep reading. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. 
And David said, and the Philistine said unto David in verse 43, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves, or we can think of sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's. And he said, He'll give you into my hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came near uh, nigh to David, that David hastened and ran toward the enemy army to meet the Philistine. Now listen, I am not a military strategist. I guess that's the word. I would never tell David to run towards that giant. You know what I'd say? Look, you need to run in there, run around him, make him chase you. Get him all tired out. Do you remember the rope-a-dope? Muhammad Ali. Get the other guy just so tired he'd fall down. Give that guy a heart attack. Don't run at the guy. But David ran at the guy. He ran at that big giant. In verse 49, And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in the forehead that the stones sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. Now you have to remember, any character in those days showed Goliath having a bronze helmet, protecting his forehead, protecting the bridge of his nose, and coming down over his nose. Yet the penetration of that stone was so awesome that it went through that helmet. Now, there's some people trying to explain that away. I was reading this week. Some theologians, theologians believe this, that when Goliath saw David, and the Bible says he disdained him, that Goliath just took his helmet off and let it lay there. Now, I don't agree with that. I think the God who does the impossible Brought that giant down, even with as much army or armor as what he had. You see, when he picked up the stone, he picked up the God of gods. He picked up the mighty God, the holy of holies. He picked up God himself in that stone. And when he winged it, he wasn't that good. But God controlled it and brought down the giant. I'm reminded uh, the other day, I handed my phone. Now, some of you folks that don't have a whole lot to do, you have downloaded Wordscape. You know what Wordscape is, where you find the words and all that kind of stuff? Well, I was over at my grandmother's, um, I'm sorry, at my son's house, and my granddaughter was sitting there. She was 11 at the time, and I couldn't get a word. She says, hey, Poppy, let me do it. Okay. Uh, yeah, right. Okay, here you go. She got it in a matter of two minutes, a, th- a six-letter word. And she handed it to me, and she goes, here you go, boomer. And, well, of course, I laughed. Well, if I'm a boomer, what are you? She says, we're Zoomers. We're Zoomers. And as a boomer, I love choirs. I I still like choirs. And I can't wait to go to heaven and just, and some of you folks that think, oh, I like like this one. We're going to have a heavenly choir, aren't we? I can't wait to hear it. But until we do, my heavenly choir is the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. I love them. Every song that I hear from them is like an anointed song. They sing a song, and I I just want to tell you the first verse. It says, you don't have to worry, and don't be afraid. Joy comes in the morning. Troubles, they don't last always. For there's a friend in Jesus who will wipe your tears away. 
And if your heart is broken, just lift your hands and say, Oh, I know that I can make it. I know that I can stand. No matter what may come my way, my life is in your hands. You see, that life was not in the giant's hand for David. David's life was in God's hands. What did David do? Well, he got offended for God. David didn't get discouraged or criticized. David lived a life of impossible. And David, he put God on his stones. I read an interesting story, and I'll close with this. A couple years ago, and I follow legal cases once in a while, especially with Christian schools and things like that. Two ladies that owned a daycare center, Christian day care center, were being sued. I, I'm not sure what it was. But the lawyer was, oh, they went up to the lawyer and they said, uh, Mr. Attorney, we're going to pray that God has the gods on your stones today. And he's like, I don't know what the world that means. Okay, great. So he begins to question. He begins to talk. And every time, every time he'd say something, these two women would do this. And it kind of bothered him. So he said to the women, but what, what are you doing? That's a distraction. Every time I say something, you're moving your head. She says, well, every time you say something that's awesome, we're putting God on your words. We're putting God on your stones. Oh, well, keep it up. He says, because it's working. The judge called the lawyer in and said, those women sitting there, what are they doing? The lawyer said, well, you heard the story of David and Goliath. He goes, yeah, I have. He said, uh, well, they're putting God on my words. They're putting God on the stones that brought down the giant. And this is what the judge said. Well, tell them to keep it up. Because when they don't do this, you don't look so good. But every time they do this, man, you look good. They won the case. They won the case. Whatever your situation is, your giant Put God in there. Put God in there. Saturday night, last Saturday night, my wife came home, and there's an ambulance sitting across the street. I'm like, what in the world? You know, that always comes. And they're taking their daughter away. 30 years of age, had a stroke, fell down the stairs, hit her head, seizures. That family has a giant. That girl is still in intensive care after one week. I don't know what your giant's going to be. But I know one thing. When your giant shows up, you need to understand and you need to know how to unleash the power of God to take care of your giant. Let's pray. Father God, We just depend upon you for everything in life. The air that we breathe, the relationships that we're in. And Father, I think of one of the greatest offenses that people have. And that is turning their backs on your son. Lord, I pray as we close this service wherever we're at, at home, here, wherever we view this. But I beg you, don't turn your back on Jesus. Jesus will bring down those giants in our life. And we will truly live the life of impossible. And we thank you for it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.